Thank you for joining us for the session entitled Intro to, per to uh, Permanent Residency, Concepts and Terminology. We are here with Anthony Pavelski from the Office of, for Global Professionals and Scholars at Mass General Brigham, Brigham and Amanda Doran at the International Scholars Office at MIT. A um, couple of Zoom tips for you today. Uh, please do mute yourself. Um, change your name so that we can see your name displayed on your uh, Zoom tile, please. Turn on your video so that we can see you and so that you can fully participate in the meeting. Uh, we welcome for you to connect with your colleagues through the chat box and ask questions in the chat. Uh, I will monitor the chat. I will pass along questions to our colleagues, Amanda and Anthony, as the presentation proceeds. And if time permits, we will also uh, take some questions at the end. Thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it over to Amanda and Anthony. Okay, um, before we get started, I just did want to mention a couple of things about getting involved in SIW and GRAC. As you probably already know, the Spring Immigration Workshop is hosted by the NAFSA Governmental Regulatory Affairs Committee, or GRAC which is a Region 11 subcommittee focused on U.S. laws, rules, and regulations as they pertain to international students and scholars uh, enrolled, employed, or visiting educational institutions. And we are going to have a call for new members in June, so please keep an eye on your email. Anthony and I are both members of GRAC, so you're welcome to contact us um, if you have any questions. So, um, to get started, I first wanted to run through our agenda to let you know what we're planning to talk about today. This is intended to kind of be a, a beginner session to go over the basics of permanent residence and some of the main concepts and terminology. So we're gonna talk about immigrant versus non-immigrant visas. We'll give you an overview of what permanent residence is some of the benefits and obligations. We'll talk a little bit about the steps in the green card process, some of the common types of green cards or categories of permanent residence that you might hear your international students and scholars talking about. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the option of applying for work and travel permission while the green card is pending. Uh, talk a little bit about your role as an advisor, and some resources, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. So immigrant versus non-immigrant visas. An immigrant visa is issued to a person who wishes to live permanently in the US. A non-immigrant visa is issued to a person with permanent residence outside the US, so in another country, uh, but who wishes to be in the U.S. on a temporary basis for tourism, medical treatment, business, temporary work or study, for example. So the visas that we typically work with as international student and scholar advisors are non-immigrant visas, like the F, the J, the H. Um, and related to the, this immigrant versus non-immigrant is the concepts of immigrant and non-immigrant intent. So as I said, the F, J, and H visas are non-immigrant visas. And specifically, F and J, which are the most common student and scholar visas, require non-immigrant intent. So in order to get those visas from a consulate, the applicant has to convince the officer at the consulate that they do not intend to immigrate to the US. The H-1B, on the other hand, is considered a dual intent visa category. So it means that it allows for people to have either non-immigrant intent or to be intending to immigrate to the US. So what does permanent resident mean? It means that the person has permission to reside permanently in or immigrate to the US. A permanent resident is not a citizen but they can apply for citizenship or naturalization later if they wish, it's not required. A permanent resident continues to hold a foreign passport and has many privileges similar to those of US citizens, but cannot vote. Thanks, Amanda. So 
many of the foreign nationals that maybe come to your university or are doing research maybe want a green card because of some of the benefits. It would give them the freedom to work and live permanently in the U.S., presuming they don't commit a crime or commit an act that would make them removable from the U.S. They then have the right to work and live really anywhere in the U.S. in any occupation, although some occupations are exclusively for U.S. citizens. And depending on the type of green card they acquired, they can obtain U.S. citizenship within three or five years. Three years through a marriage-based green card, and then five years maybe through an employer-sponsored green card or self-sponsored green card. And another big benefit is they have the ability to sponsor family members. So it's very common. Maybe mom and dad are a little older in the home country and they want to be closer to the grandkids or surrounding family. Great benefit is if you have a green card, you can sponsor family members. And then the green card does offer expanded legal rights and benefits. So for example, if you're on the J-1 visa and your job is terminated as a postdoc, you then have a 30-day grace period. You don't face that restriction as a green card holder, for example. It also opens up additional sources of grant funding and employment opportunities as well. However, there are obligations with the green card. Um, sometimes there's misconceptions that you have a green card, can do anything. Not the case. You must obey all the laws of the US, state, local, federal, wherever you are. So just as a reminder, Marijuana is still illegal at the federal level, maybe legal at the state level, but it can pose problems for a green card holder. Another misconception is while I'm a green card holder, taxes aren't that big of a deal. No, you must file taxes and it's a worldwide income to the IRS and state tax authorities. So you can't come in the US, make all your money overseas and expect the US government not to tax your overseas income. And then you must expect to support the democratic form of government, not to ch challenge or overthrow the US government. And a big one that is often overlooked is if you are a male between the ages of 18 to 25, you must register with the selective service. And then your green card is typically issued for 10 years and you must renew it before it expires. Next slide. And then one final point we'll talk about is it is possible to abandon a green card. So you can't just come to the US, get a green card, leave, go back to your home country and come in once or twice a year using it as a tourist visa. If you move to another country and intend to live there permanently or outside the US for long periods of time, you can't have abandoned the green card. If you fa fail to file income tax filing while living outside the US, you can also trigger an abandonment of the green card as well or if you declare yourself as a non-immigrant on the US tax returns. So being a green card holder does offer a lot of benefits, but there are compliance obligations the foreign national must take as well, such as living in the US, filing taxes, obeying US law. It is by no means a glorified tourist visa or a part-time means to stay in the US. Can you go next slide? Some reason it's not. There we go. There we go. So I'll start now with an overview of the green card process. And the first thing I'll say is, how long does it take? Depends on the process, but it can be a while. Um, U.S. green cards are numerically limited each fiscal year. Fiscal year runs October 1st to uh, September 30th. And applicants place in line for a green card is called the priority date. That's the date they file for their green card, meaning the first step of it, maybe the I-130 for a marriage-based case, I-140 for an employer-sponsored case, or the labor certification. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's really their place in line. And that place in line is determined by the country of birth and the green card classification they filed under. So some countries like India and China have a very long wait for green cards in the employment category. In comparison, if you're coming from the Mexico or Philippines, the family-based categories can have very long waits depending on which family member you're trying to bring over. So the wait can be very lengthy depending on the category, where you're from. So each month, the Department of State publishes a visa bulletin, and that kind of explains whose place in line is current, what green cards they're currently processing. So this is just a little excerpt we took. And I believe this is from the employment-based category. So C means current, meaning if you're in that category, we have green card numbers, you're available. But you can see uh, for the December bulletin under that employment-based second, 
there's a lot of dates listed. That means those places in line for the green cards are not ready to be issued yet. So there is a wait. So again, it's not uncommon if someone's from India or China to have a lengthy wait. One thing I do mention anytime I'm asked about this is, well, what's the fastest way to get to a green card? If you do happen to have the love of your life that is an American citizen, that is by far the fastest and the easiest process compared to some of the others we'll talk about later. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the common permanent residence options, um, and these are the ones that we kind of hear about the most from our international students and scholars um, and get questions about. There's the diversity visa lottery, permanent residence based on a family relationship, and permanent residence based on an employee relationship could be a employment-based permanent residence sponsored by the employer. So maybe your institution is sponsoring an assistant professor um, for a green card based on their tenure track employment. And then there's also self-sponsored employment-based green cards where the applicant can um, file and qualify based on their, their own professional qualifications. So the diversity visa lottery, um, it's called, officially called the Diversity Immigrant Visa Program or the DV program. And it makes up to 50,000 immigrant visas available annually drawn from random selection among all entries to individuals who are from countries with low rates of immigration to the US. Um, there's no cost to register for the diversity visa program. And it's basically you have to be from, as I said, a country with low immigration rates to the US. And then there's some other basic qualifications. Um, for example, the, the principal applicant has to have either a high school diploma um, or high school education or two years of qualifying work experience. So there's some, some basic qualifications. The program is administered by the U.S. Department of State, and there's actually a lot of information about it on the U.S. Department of State website. If you go to U.S. visas, then to the immigrate section, um, you'll find a lot of information there. The diversity visas are distributed among six geographic regions, and no single country may receive more than 7% of the available diversity immigrant visas in any one year. Um, next is family-based green cards. As Anthony mentioned, this can be the, the relatively quickest way to get a green card. If you're an immediate relative of a U.S. citizen, you can become a green card holder based on your family relationship if you meet certain eligibility requirements. You are an immediate relative if you're the spouse of a U.S. citizen the unmarried child under 21 years of age of a U.S. citizen, or the parent of a U.S. citizen, if the U.S. citizen is 21 years of age or older. Marriage to a U.S. citizen. So there are two steps in this process. The U.S. citizen who is kind of sponsoring the person for a green card would file the I-130 form petition for an alien relative. And then the uh, foreign national would either file form I-485, adjustment of status application, if they're planning to adjust their status to permanent resident inside the US, or apply for a non-immigrant, or sorry, they would apply for an immigrant visa at a US consulate. USCIS will review the request and they'll schedule an interview at a local USCIS office to make sure that the, the marriage is bona fide. They do ask um, questions like color of your spouse's toothbrush, first date you went on, right. last movie you saw together. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it's good if you can answer those questions correctly. <laughs> um, if the marriage is under two years old, a conditional green card is issued. So if the marriage is more than two years old and you pass the interview, you'll get a regular green card with valid for 10 years. Um, but if it's under two years old, you'll get a conditional green card valid for, um, I think two years. 
And um, then you have to file form, sorry, file form I-751 before the conditional card expires with accompanying evidence demonstrating the continued validity of the marriage. After three years, an applicant who obtained a green card through marriage may apply to become a US citizen. So this is actually quicker also than um, other types of people who got green cards, um, say through employment-based, uh, they have to wait five years to apply for citizenship. So how long does it take? Uh, it depends. <laughs> generally, it takes, um, generally, it's the quickest. Um, it's not something you should be advising a student or scholar about, like giving them a time frame. Um, they should definitely talk to an attorney because even though it tends to be the quickest, you know, you don't know everything about their background or their specific situation. Um, and so it's good that they get individualized advice. And one thing to mention with the marriage-based green cards is there is a financial support component too. Oh, yeah. Same thing with any family-based green card. So if your student is marrying another student, they may not necessarily have the financial means to meet the test that USCS has laid out. So may need a co-sponsor. So really, we'll say it now and kind of repeat it a few times. It is good to have reputable counsel to refer your students and scholars to if they have these types of questions to have one a reality check and understand maybe what they're getting into for a marriage-based green card. Right. Um, you know, they might also have questions about how this marriage-based application might affect their F1 status or their J1 status or their H1B status. Um, and we're always very careful to say, you know, we can tell you, give you some general information, say about immigrant or non-immigrant intent and applying for a visa, but anything related to your personal permanent residence application, talk to an immigration attorney. Um, all right, Anthony. Yep. So employment-based green card. So I'm using this term very broadly because this term is going to encompass both sponsored green cards and self-sponsored green cards. So much like the marriage-based green cards, the process is one to three steps. Depending on the green card you're on, the first step might be what's known as a labor certification or PERM, or you get a prevailing wage from the Department of Labor. Second step is the I-140. That's to request to say, hey, we as the employer are sponsoring this person for a permanent position. And then maybe the I-45 or maybe the immigrant visa request at the consulate. So the steps are going to vary depending on the category. Now I'm going to go through a few different categories. Your university may never sponsor one of these categories, but it is something that may come up. A student may ask you like, hey, I'm in the business field. I heard I can get a green card for being a manager. Um, yeah, so there's the first preference green card category, which is kind of the Cadillac of visa categories, usually available regardless of nationality but they're really achievement-based ones. So the Extraordinary Ability EB1A can be used for artists, entertainers, athletes, um, scientists, it does not require sponsorship. The Outstanding Professor mm -hmm. and Researcher category, the EB2, or I'm sorry, the EB1B, that does require sponsorship. So that's what you may commonly see when you have postdocs saying, oh, I need my EB1B, my EB1B. And then going back to that, um, student in business, there is the EB1C multinational manager executive. Great example, you work for Google UK, you come to Google North America, you're a manager, you can get a green card for being in a managerial position and working for a multinational company. The second class of employment-based green cards is the second professionals group, which is really, you have a master's degree or a bachelor's in five, or in some cases, you have an exceptional ability, which includes a national interest waiver, the NIW. So it's very common for postdocs or other groups to say, oh, I'm going to file my NIW, my EB2 NIW. That's a self-sponsored green card category. And then finally, the third preference category, which is really bachelor's level positions. On occasion, your university might sponsor, let's say, a bioinformatics specialist because hard to fill position, they have a unique skill set, but it requires a bachelor's. So each of these categories will have a different place in line and do have different requirements. So we'll go to the next slide and we can look at some uh, visual of it. So 
broadly speaking, depending on what your occupation is or what your field of endeavor is, that may dictate which, which green cards are available or which are options. Again, marriage to a US citizen or family-based or diversity lottery are great options if they're available. Um, in some cases, they're not. So if you have students in the arts, for example, they may look at the ED1A, uh, which is that extraordinary ability. It is a very difficult green card to acquire in the arts. Athletes and entertainment can be done, but it does take time. There's also an EB2 category called exceptional ability in the arts. Uh, not as commonly used by some, but it is also certainly an option. If you're advising students in like the business world, that EB1C, um, what we call the PERM process or labor certification is commonly used. And that's a market test to show that the employer cannot find a qualified, willing and able US worker. Um, in some cases, the NIW could be used in a business context. But again, it's not your job to determine which green card the person should be seeking, but really mention them like, well, what's your purpose here? Is it to be a student, a scholar? And I'd really suggest you speak with an attorney to understand what path makes sense for you, the pros and cons and the cost. Because we haven't talked about costs, but any of these green cards all have fees and they're not little fees either. Um, most of these green card processes usually do require the use of an attorney in the employer sponsored contact. But going back to this chart, uh, if you're advising students in the STEM fields, you know, they have the EB1A, maybe the EB1B once they finish their training and are in a professional position. Uh, the NIW is a very attractive option for researchers. And then there's the PERM process. Now, if you're regularly working with faculty and staff that are tenure track, they have a special process they can go through that's a little shorter, a little easier. Um, and is relatively low cost because it's really looking for the best qualified best qualified applicant versus the minimally qualified applicant, which is what um, industry would use when doing one of these market tests. If you have students in the healthcare field, two common options are the PERM, again, the uh, market test or something called Schedule A. These are shortage occupations and the two that come to mind always to me are physical therapists and nurses. Physical therapists are in a pretty good position because they can usually get an H-1B visa at a cap exempt employer, but nursing is still very tough as it's not been universally recognized as a four year occupation. So this can be a bit more challenging if you're advising F1s, um, they wanna get a green card or something because it's really all dependent on where they go for the employer. So based on this chart, you know, depending on the field they're in, there's different options. And again, healthcare could also maybe use the EB1B as well or the NIW depending on the person's occupation or what they're doing. So this is a little more of a complicated advanced portion of the green card process, but we have to remember that our immigration system is not the most modern. Um, we're sometimes using rules that are 30 years old, if not older. And so back when travel was more of a novelty or a rare thing as part of the green card process, the government wanted to make sure those going through it had travel permission or some kind of bridge as the green card process was working through. So when an applicant gets to the step of their green card process where they can file that adjustment of status, they're able to file for two documents, sometimes issued in one card. The first thing they can apply for is an EAD card, and you may know that from OPT, STEM OPT. Um, this is a work permit card they can get as part of the green card process. The big advantage is if they have a spouse that is in a visa classification that can't work, they can suddenly pick up the ability to start working in the US. The second part of the card is advanced parole, and that's permission to travel outside the US. So again, that's why I mentioned, a little bit of an outdated concept that we're asking permission to travel when travel is so much easier these days. Um, depending on how the card is issued, it may be issued for just work or it may be issued like on the bottom of the slide as the combo card. Um, the biggest thing I always stress is if an F1 or J comes to me and says, hey, I'm gonna go home and travel and I file for a green card. Talk to your attorney at once. Amanda mentioned that not all visas are created equal and the F and J are not dual intent. So if proper precautions aren't taken, an applicant could get stuck outside the US or abandon the green card. But again, you as the F advisor, J advisor, your responsibility is for your specific programs and making sure the student or scholar is complying with that. 
best to direct them toward their attorneys so they can understand should they travel, should they not travel, what should they be doing? Um, because it is a personal legal application. We're also paying for an attorney to mitigate the risks. Right, so um, we just kind of brainstormed some common student and scholar questions we tend to get. Um, these are all taken from real life. I've just arrived in the US to start my postdoc. Can you tell me how I can apply for a green card, become a permanent resident? Um, how long will it take for me to get my green card? What if my green card doesn't arrive by the time my F1 status ends or my J1 ends? Can I travel? Um, how does this affect my F or J status? And as we've emphasized, it's really, really important to make sure that you're not advising on things that are outside of your, your purview. Um, Personally, I, I advise international scholars, and I'm always really careful to explain that I'm only really allowed to advise them on visa issues related to their MIT employment or appointment. I can give them general information that's publicly available about, you know, non-immigrant intent or that kind of thing. Um, but if they really need advice about their individual situation, how their pending green card will impact their status or vice versa, um, they really need to consult with an immigration attorney. Um, as Anthony said, it's expensive to hire an attorney. Um, you're not actually required for self-sponsored green cards to, to have an attorney, but it's a really good idea. Um, and a lot of times, students and scholars will come to you with questions because they don't really want to um, have to pay for a consult with their attorney or, you know, it might be easier to, to ask you. And I always try to like, I'm like a broken record referring them back to their attorney. Um, but I think that's really important. It, it really is important that um, any organization have like a good list of attorneys they could recommend to. Yeah. Um, I think the New England region has a wonderful wealth of talent and they've generally been more than happy to address questions from students or scholars. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your yeah. office might have a list. Yeah. Um, and we also have, have some resources up here. The AILA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Um, if you go to their website, they have a, a referral information. Um, there's some other legal directories. Massachusetts has the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, or MIRA, um, and they list a lot of um, resources in Massachusetts and New England, and then also nationally. Uh, there is a lot of general information on the USCIS website and also the Department of State website, um, but I... I would caution that it's sometimes a little yeah. misleading because it makes it seem like it's so easy. You just do this, this, and this. <laughs> um, so I would say, look at that information, but also also consult with an attorney. And I always mention like, immigration is a really complex field. And the best way someone described it to me was like a pie. You start carving the pie up based on, based on different areas of expertise. And at the end of it, there's maybe just one slice that's this person's specific issue. So I've seen firms that offer money back guarantees, discounts, and honestly, the green card is an investment in any foreign national's future. So something like a money back guarantee or a refund really is highly questionable because why would you want to get a denial on your immigration record versus you know yeah. putting a strong application in and going forward? Um, at the same time, if anyone says they have a 100% success yeah. rate, I would also be cautious. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we finished the main portion up and some questions have been trick trickling in. Um, I'll do the first one. Could we talk about the path from H-1B to green card process, timeline options? So again, the path to H to green card is going to depend on what category is being used, what position the person holds and when you choose to file it. So there's not really a one answer for that. So I know, for example, some of my colleagues that do the special handling perms for professors, because of how long the process is taking right now, 
pretty much as soon as the offer is made, they've been starting the green card process because the piece with Department of Labor is just taking so long that they don't want to lose the window. They have to file that green card in. Whereas um, maybe you have an Indian scholar who they have potential, but they're just not there yet. Maybe they wait a few years and then try to do the EB1B research-based green card. So again, there's not one path, not one option. It's going to depend on your institutional policies as well, the job and the person's background. Um, one other thing I want to mention that I often talk to international scholars about is you don't have to have an H before you apply for a green card. Sometimes there's this myth that the pathway is H1B and then you kind of then you apply for a green card. Anyone in any visa status can apply for permanent residence. Um, it's just these other issues we talked about, like travel or making sure you continue to have work permission while it's pending. Um, but it's not it's not a like a required stepping stone to an H1B. Um, one reason that people like to have a H1B while the green card is pending is because the H1B is a dual intent category. So instead of having to apply for advanced parole travel permission, they can travel on the H if needed um, while the green card's in process. So it's nice to have, but it's not necessary. Yeah, I've done many J to H green cards in my career mm -hmm. and commonly see it now. The important thing is they have good counsel and have a realistic timeline if they have travel, work authorizations an issue. And if they are subject to 212E, that two-year home rule for the Js, that they do have that waiver filing for a green card does not absolve them of the two-year home residency requirement. I've seen situations where Js don't pay attention to it. They file the green card, come to our office panicked because they've now got a request for evidence on their adjustment of status stating that you're subject to a two-year home rule. Show us you spent two years back home or you have a waiver. So yeah. having counsel is really important. And it does kind of bleed into the question that came up. Can, I can you talk more about a student submitting a marriage-based green card without an attorney? Not recommended. I sometimes meet with PhD students that submit their own. Look, everyone's an adult. We can give them the best advice they can and they can choose to make a decision. Um, Marriage-based green cards, unlike some of the other categories, are some of the easier applications to file on your own if you have sufficient financial income, you have requisite documents, and there's no criminal issues. So I've met many foreign nationals that have done it on their own without issue. The advantage of having an attorney is you have an advocate, someone's going to check your paperwork, accompany to the interview, and really address any weird things that potentially come up if there's a delay or if something just seems to be stuck. So there's no requirement they have an attorney, but certainly it is an advantage to have a good attorney. Um, do you take actions on your F or H records once your student or scholar informs that they've entered using advanced parole? Um, I can answer this about the J. If a scholar tells me they've entered the U.S. on advanced parole, we end their J program because they're no longer considered to be a, a bona fide J. Um, and hopefully they have work permission as well. For the H, we don't do anything. Yeah, I would echo similar with the H. Um, assuming they have the EAD as well, we're not going to touch anything. We might leave the H in as a uh, backup in case something yeah. happens. But again, your institutional policies are what's going to dictate how you take care of your data auditing and record cleanup, because it can vary greatly depending on the size of your program, risks, or what you knew or what you didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, generally, with the F and J, I think there is more oversight to it because those are not um, dual intent visa classifications. So if you've entered on that advanced parole, you're not really a J visa holder anymore. You're an adjustment applicant using that EAD card. Um, does applying for the diversity lottery as an F1 create a red flag? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's a diversity lottery benefit. Is this open to anyone? I think when we do our J applications, we actually ask like, you know, have you filed for a green card or anything? And if diversity lottery comes up, I think our follow-up questions are, what well, were you selected? Did you file anything further? Because filing for it alone isn't going to penalize you. It's once you get selected and are further in the weeds is when you may have a problem. And maybe you don't come in on that F or J because you're waiting for the consular interview and you're gonna enter as a green card holder. Yeah, I mean, and from what I've heard, and this is just 
you know, me not being an immigration attorney, like I've never heard anyone say it's a problem just entering the lottery. Yeah. And the thing to caution about the diversity lottery is um, watch out for scams. Um, my office, when we had more resources, would kind of send a blast email saying, hey, diversity lottery is open. It's free to apply. Apply through government websites only. But watch out for scams where they're going to charge you a fee, say you'll get a better placement in line, or say you can like jump the queue and get ahead of other applicants. You know, all scams. Yeah. Um, could you address ARO DSO role restrictions, if any, F and J extension and benefits recommendations after an I-130, I-140 has been filed? Kind of a gray area. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on your institutional policy. The different flavors I've seen is as soon as you file anything, um, especially on the J side, your J record's done, they don't wanna do anything. The F side, and I, I think it comes down to what you filed. If you haven't filed the I-40 yet and you're in the US, you're still complying with terms of your F and J, you haven't rocked the boat, nothing's an issue. It's really when travel comes up yeah. where you're getting ready to file that I-45 is the question, like what's your intent in the US? So again, don't have an answer because it's going to depend on what parameters your program has set. Maybe you want to talk to outside counsel or your general counsel to kind of set up, what do we do in these situations to have kind of an, a stock operating procedure? Yeah, it, it comes up in my office when we're um, processing J extensions. Um, and we, I would say Anthony's right. It kind of depends on what your institutional policy is and the specifics of the situation. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so like if I get a J extension and they tell me they file an I-140, I'm fine extending the J, but my concern is that they're going to travel because now that they kind of have expressed some form of immigrant intent, getting that visa stamp or then processing with CBP would be a very unpleasant experience, right. something I wouldn't subject them to. But if they tell me they filed the I-485, then um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're not going to extend their J. Yeah, and the, the J program is unique in that as the program sponsor, you have, I think, a wide latitude and discretion as to what policies and procedures you set. So it could vary from one institute to another. Uh, I don't personally handle F1s. In fact, the bulk of my population are PhDs, MDs, so pretty sophisticated positions. So the green card challenges I'm seeing are a little bit different than, um, than F1 who's met the love of her life at like 21 years old and doesn't have any money, for example. So oh, I think we've finished the main portion of our presentation. We're open to any questions for a few more minutes, but it really was just a presentation to kind of go over like the basics, the terminology, and to kind of understand why a green card is very different than the F or what it actually entails. And feel free to put a question in the chat or just um, jump in and, and talk. I feel like we don't have any more questions. Nope. You did a great job and you answered everything. Everything is perfectly clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, oh, somebody just put in a question. Yay. Can you please mention again the steps to an employment-based application? Uh, it'll depend on which category. So if we're doing a labor certification or special handling, it's going to be PERM, I-140, and then I-45. If you're doing um, the research space routes like the EB1A, EB1B, or NIW, it's the I-140 and the I-485. And one thing we didn't mention is the, the processing times for the employment-based green cards will vary based on the category. Uh, and USCIS has now been slowly expanding premium processing to different employment categories. So the NIWs can now get premium processing but it's not the 15 day turnaround you get for the H-1Bs, for example. Um, EB1C for the multinational managers is also getting it, um, but the steps are great, but it's what does the timeline look like when your person's gonna file it? Because I did see a comment, oh, I got my marriage-based green card in three months in 2020, 
2012, yeah, there was a time when it was a lot quicker than what we are seeing now. Um, we have an interesting question. What are the strangest cases you've recently encountered with an employment-based application? <laughs> I mean, this wasn't recent, but early on, I talked about finding a good attorney. I got an email saying, hi, do you know any deportation attorneys? I said, why do you need a deportation attorney? Because my immigration attorney said I should contact a deportation attorney if my green card isn't going well. But they also came up with a strategy, I'll file a second green card and that'll cure the first green card. Um, very discerning to see just the fact they were even that panicked about being deported, but it does show the risks that depending on your underlying visa status, if you don't maintain an H or have some kind of backup, you do risk being deported. Um, I, have a, I, don't, I don't have any strange cases, but we do occasionally see um, cases where somebody's adjustment of status is held up for months or years. Um, and of course, it's not something we can advise on and they need to work with an attorney, but that can get um, very stressful for the, the employee. Um, so I've definitely seen outliers where it's taken several years for somebody. To yeah, I've seen that as well. I've also seen green cards issued in error where 212E was not fulfilled or um, in the medical context, someone was doing a Conrad waiver, which is three years of service in a medically underserved community. And the green card is issued before they fulfilled their commitment of the three years of service, which is a very big deal because if they don't fulfill those three years of service as an H-1B, they can't get a green card or 212E waived. So things can happen. Um, would you recommend that a student get an attorney outside of their company attorney when it comes to PR-based applications? Uh, most employers usually have an attorney retained for PR matters because the law firm dual represents the foreign national and the visa holder. In those cases, and depending on the type of green card that's being sought, the I-140 and the labor cert are really the employer's application. So they can kind of control when they file, when they want to file, what attorney they're using. The student really isn't in a bargaining position to go get their own attorney and have that attorney take over. Um, I know this kind of comes up in some cases if a student's working for a very large company that contracts out with some of the mega firms. They're sometimes dissatisfied with the um, quality of the service or the basically high touch relationship because they only talk to the employer process moves slow, but ultimately the employer controls it. Mm -hmm. But they could certainly um, maybe for the adjustment part, get their own attorney. I mean, they, they could, I mean, I've rarely seen it. What I've, what I've more commonly seen um, is the company says, hey, we'll pay for the first two steps of the green card, your labor cert and your I-140, but you're on your own for the 485, which is completely reasonable. Employee says, well, I'll do it on my own or I'll find my own attorney to save some money. That's where it gets worrisome yeah. because you don't know what they filed, when they filed, or what that application looks like. Uh, in general, most reputable employers have counsel they work with. It's really oftentimes the employee is not satisfied because it's not going on their timeline or they feel their needs aren't being met. Um, and it comes down to for the attorney, who is the client, the company or the software engineer that they're doing the labor certification for, it's the company. Can I just add real quick, that's a really great point, Anthony, but I think sometimes I've referred uh, students and scholars to their own independent immigration attorney if they wanna ask about changing jobs. Yeah. After an I-140 has been approved or after an employer has filed an I-140 because then that attorney has a con might very well or is likely to have a conflict of interest. Um, yeah. if the student goes to them with those questions. So in that situation, I found it valuable to just refer them to their own attorney and get advice about how things can play out so that they're fully informed. And again, it depends on what process they went under and kind of where they work, what they're doing. So it's kind of hard to answer like this always works because in some cases, yeah, it may be helpful to have their own attorney because while they were doing the employer sponsored green card, they also filed an NIW. And I have had a client and I've had clients and employees do this where we're almost done with recruitment and they suddenly say, Hey, I have an I-140 approved. What does that mean? Oh, well, now we wasted ad money, but good for you and we're done with the process. Yeah. All right. I think that is it for questions.
All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for coming. Um, if you have any examples of crazy questions that you get from people, um, let us know, because that might be fun to put in um, if we ever do a similar presentation. Yeah, anything with the cannabis industry is always interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're like, I am a startup entrepreneur doing a weed delivery service online. How would this impact my F1 visa potential green card? Yeah, red flags everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.